some tools to, uh, to share with your co-workers and family uh, about Christmas this morning. Uh, a lot of times we, we find folks complaining about Christmas being too commercialized and, and yeah, okay, I, I, you're right. But so what? It still does not take away from the fact that everybody knows that we celebrate the birth of the Savior, amen. And whether uh, some folks would, would care to admit it or not, this is one of the, the easiest times to share your faith and to let someone know that unto us truly a Savior was born, amen. So if you got your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. We're going to talk about prophecies fulfilled. And... Jesus, through the course of his life, we're going to get a little bit more on this later, fulfilled over 300 prophecies. Okay? Uh, just, just doing a couple of them and, and, you know, coming into one person's life, the statistics of that fulfillment is astronomical. Okay? Uh, 17 of them with just, just with his birth. And we're going to look at a couple of those today because, you know, somebody might ask you, you go, well, well uh, what about this Jesus? I mean, I mean, yeah, he's got a cute little baby. I saw a flannel gram. I went to a manger uh, scene uh, uh, down at the wherever it was. And uh, what about him? Was he a cute baby? You better believe it. He was awesome. But he was a savior. Amen. He was a savior. And he came so that you and I can be forgiven of sins. And that is the greatest gift that we will ever, ever receive. Okay, so we're in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. This is um, the sons of Israel. They're getting their, their prophetic uh, words spoken over them by their father. It gets to Judah. And this is what is referred to as a messianic uh, prophecy because he uses the title Shiloh, which was a messianic title. Okay, and he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of all the people. Now, that word scepter means judicial power, okay? And what he's saying is the judicial power of the nation will not depart until the Messiah comes. All right, that's very important to understand because. Uh, what it states is that the Messiah will come um, at a time prior to the nation's judicial power being removed. All right. Now, if you remember in history that although Judah was deprived of his national sovereignty during its 70 years of captivity in Babylon, it still remained its judicial power because they were allowed to have their own judges even while they were in captivity. And they were still allowed to abide by their own laws. Now, the, the turning point in that came uh, approximately uh, 7 AD in the latter time of Herod's reign when the Romans removed the power of the Sanhedrin to pronounce the death penalty. And what that did is it stripped them of all their judicial powers because they could no longer enforce their laws. Okay, you, you following with me? All right. And at that point in time, the scepter passed from Judah. Now, in the Talmud, which is the, the oral history, they state that on this occasion, the Sanhedrin covered themselves with sackcloth and ashes and, uh, and said, Woe to us, for the scepter has departed from Judah, and the Messiah has not come. There's only one problem. The Messiah did come. But he didn't come the way that they thought. They were looking for a mighty military conqueror, and he came as a child. Okay? He did come during the last years of Herod's reign, just like the Bible prophesied. If you jump over to Micah 
chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 2. It says, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel, is going forth or from long ago, from the days of eternity. He's talking about the Messiah here. Now, when we say, it says Beth Bethlehem Ephrathah, because there were two Bethlehems at the time. It's kind of like you got Springfield, Missouri, and Springfield, Illinois. They both got the same name, but they're in two different places. But he's being specific here. He, spe he says, specifically, this Bethlehem that's in Ephrathah, which was part of Judah. And if you look over in Matthew chapter 2, we're going to get there in a little bit, it specifies that as the birthplace of the Messiah. Okay? Once again, this was a prophecy that was given many, many years before it happened, but it happened nonetheless, because God's Word is true, and God's Word is trustworthy. We can depend on it. Just like the, the Pharisees at the time, they struggled with God's Word because it did not become fulfilled the way that they thought it would. And sometimes you and I, we can struggle with that because we get these preconceived ideas uh, as to how God's going to do things or, or maybe on, on how uh, something is in the Bible we interpret it because we interpret it through a 20th century American mentality. But yet God's Word is true nonetheless and as we diligently pursue it, the Holy Spirit does a pretty good job of showing us what we need to know. All right? Now, go back to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, and it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall accomplish this. What had happened when Messiah came? True government was restored. It was taken from the law and was given to the Messiah. Okay. Now, Understand something. There will be no end to the increase of his government. Uh, I'm going to take a little, little rabbit trail here. All right? Understand something. God rules today. All right? People will say to you, well, Satan is the God of this world. Okay, but he's not God, God. <laughs> he has to submit himself to the Lord every single time the Lord commands him. All right? Satan's authority is not universal. It's extremely limited. And Satan's authority does not apply to you if you're in Christ. You've got a different king. Amen? Please understand that. You do not have to answer when he calls. They'll say, oh, don't you remember uh, back in the day when you'd get mad, this is how we dealt with it? Come on back! You say, you know, no. Nah. No, nah, I don't think we're going to do that anymore. No, nah, we got a different way of dealing with things. Okay. Uh, I heard a, a, a guy say uh, recently, uh, and it kind of made me laugh, and, and he was talking about Christian counseling. And uh, he said, why do Christians go to counselors? He says, because we don't drink or do drugs. And, and it's, it was kind of tongue-in-cheek the way he said it. But the point was is that we're not, we don't have the liberty to ignore our problems. And we don't have the liberty to deal with our problems in an ungodly way. Amen. God loves us too much to let us flounder out there. He wants us to be free, and he wants us to be strong. Okay. And thank God for that. Uh, the first prophecy uh, we, we see of, of the Messiah uh, came from God Himself back in the garden uh, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse uh, 15. Uh, kind of uh, heard a little bit about that not too long ago. 
It says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, he's talking to the devil, and between your seed and her seed, who will bruise you on the head and you'll bruise him on the heel. He says it's between your seed and her seed. He didn't say Adam's seed. He said her seed. Satan would be defeated by the seed of the woman. We read in Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. I, I heard that happened somewhere. Now, someone would say, well, well, that's impossible. That can't happen. That would be a miracle. Well, yeah, yeah, it absolutely was. And understand something. All these things were talked about thousands of years before they came to pass, but they did come to pass nonetheless. So when we, when we talk about things and people say, well, Jesus, he was born in a manger. Yes, he was. Do you know how he was born? Well, uh, I'm assuming the regular way. Well, no, you know what? He, he, he's, he had, was born of a virgin. What? That don't make no sense. Well, let's find out why it makes sense. Okay. Uh, jump over to Matthew chapter 1. In verse 18, uh, now I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but this gives you some stuff you can tell somebody else who might not be as smart as you are. Okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus was as followed. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, that means before they had, they consummated their marriage, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Also, that would have killed her. Okay. But when he had considered this, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what the spoken of the Lord through the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son, though shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Wow. Now, just for a moment, because we have a tendency to uh, not sometimes grasp the cultural aspects of things, put yourself in Joseph's position for a minute, all right? You're going to get uh, married. Okay, you're, you're getting married because you, you want to, all right? You're, you're in love with Mary, and, and uh, we're going to get married, and this is going to be great. We're going to have a family. And all of a sudden she says, uh, you know, she comes by and you kind of go, putting on a little weight, you know? <laughs> and she says, i got to tell you something. I'm pregnant. What's your first thought? Who you been fooling around with? Nobody. Who's the father? God is. How many guys are going to accept that right off the bat? No, 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 no. And, you know, I tell you, and we're going to talk about this in a couple weeks. Joseph was an extraordinarily interesting Bible character because it took a lot of trust to believe God for what was happening in his life. Understand something, it never happened before. It'll never happen again, but it happened right then. Okay, why? Because God said it would. And because he said it would, it did. And he had to trust that beyond everything that he understood, everything he understood about science, everything he understood about biology, and I don't know how much they covered that in class because you know, school was a lot different back then, but they had the basic understandings down. He had to say, wait a minute, everything I have come to believe is being challenged right now. Okay. Now, jump over to Psalms chapter 72 and verse 10. It gives us another prophecy. It, lets, it says, let, let the kings of Tarshish and the islands bring presents, the kings of Sheba and Seba, other gifts. 
Let all the kings bow down before him. All the nations serve him. Well, let's go back over to Matthew chapter 2. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, there's that Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, that means before he died, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Uh, we have seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests, scribes, and the people, he inquired of them, saying, uh, Where is the Messiah to be born? And they said, Well, Bethlehem of Judea, for that's what the prophet uh, said. Uh, and he goes on to quote it. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judea, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them exactly what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you found him, report to me so that I can go and worship him too. Now after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before him until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And coming into the house, okay, it doesn't say stable, coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, they found, fell to the ground, worshipped him, then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country another way. Okay, we see the fulfillment of that prophecy in Psalm 72. Understand something. Um, this was not at the time of the manger. This was at the time when Jesus was a little older. Okay, that's why they say it's a house and doesn't say in the manger. Or in a, in a stable. All right, you're going to find out why they come to that conclusion in a few minutes. All right, but here we see a prophecy fulfilled. Now, understand something. It says when Herod hears about this, they come, they say, Listen, we, uh, th this, this entourage comes in because it's not just uh, three guys on a camel like we see in some of the Christmas stories. It took these guys a long time to get there. All right? And they didn't come by themselves. They had a lot of stuff to bring because it was a long journey and there was no Motel 6s or there was no McDonald's. There was no places for them to stop. So they had to pro bring provision for their trip. So these guys show up with this entourage and people go, what's up with that? I mean, all of a sudden, here comes these guys, and they've got some really cool stuff. And they've got a lot of folks with them. They've got a lot of provision. Why are they here? Well, Herod brings them in and says, hey, what's going on? What are you guys doing here? Well, we, we're here to see the Messiah. We saw a star. We've been traveling for a long time, and, and here we are. And Herod said, praise God. Nah. Nah, he said, uh, what does it say? He said, he was troubled. And not only was he troubled, was, so was all of Jerusalem. You would think they'd be a little happy about that, but they weren't. Because sometimes when God does things, it does trouble us because we're creatures of habit. We like things the way they are. We're not really into change very much. And so when change comes, things can be a little unnerving, can't they? Plus, we're going to find out Herod had some other motives as well. Number one, he's in charge. And when you're in charge and you have authority, you kind of get used to it and you kind of li start liking it. And the idea of turning that authority over to somebody else doesn't seem very appealing. That's why we see in government people get in there and they start really digging the power they have and they don't want to give that up. In fact, they have a tendency of wanting more and doing whatever it takes to get more. And when you say, I don't think we should be doing it that way, they don't get happy about that. In fact, they get a little 
unnerved and unsettled. And everyone in Washington, I mean in Judea, can get unsettled as well. Okay, let's take a look at uh, verse 13. Now when they had gone, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod's going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up, took the child with his mother while it was still night, left for Egypt, and he remained there until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill, once again, what had been spoken of from the Lord to the prophet out of Egypt I call my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from around two years old and under according to the time which had determined from the Magi. So it took them a long time to get there. They get there, uh, they do their thing, they leave, and he realizes, these guys, they tricked me, they didn't come back tell me where he was. So I'm trying to do the math, but the math isn't really exact because we really don't know, but it's, we got a one to two year window here. So just to play it safe, we're gonna kill everybody two years non younger. And that's what he did, okay. Then what had been spoken of through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Another prophecy fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. See, Herod had an opportunity to seek Jesus for himself, all right, and to worship him for himself. Okay, he had the opportunity. Understand something, these guys, everything in their whole Jewish life was an expectation for the Messiah to come. That's the one thing they're all waiting for. And all of a sudden, lo, here, here he is. At least that's what they're told. Even the, the, the Pharisees are like, well, you know what? Yeah, he's supposed to be over here. But nobody, nobody went. Nobody went over there. Why? Because we got power and we kind of like it. And we don't want to give it up. See, Herod used deception. Instead of worshiping the Messiah, he used deception, and the result of that was the death of many innocent children. Okay? And all that was done in a vain attempt to keep his assumed power. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my power, so I'm going to kill every child to and under so I can keep it. And if you look in history, he died a short time later. He didn't keep nothing. He lost it all. And then when he, when he does stand before God, he's going to find out He's going to lose everything, every single thing. Now, the significance of the fulfillment of, the, of just, just these few and, and many other prophecies, because like we said, Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies, 17 just with his, his birth alone, okay? The significance of that is that it's proof positive that he is who the Bible says he is. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. Okay? Everything that the Bible says about him is true. Because it all, the, 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 once again, the statistical odds of one person fulfilling just, just the, the issues around his birth uh, are astronomical. And someone would say, well, the, the the odds of that happening are, I think it was like something to the 10th, 25th power, or something like some goofy astronomical number. I would say it's more like 100% because he did. He did it all. 
And all that does is verify the fact that he is God, incarnate. When, when you talk to people about who Jesus is, yeah, he was a cute baby in a manger, absolutely. But he was much more than that. He was God in the flesh. And then the, the next question that, that has to be asked is, is not, is he God? Because the Bible proves that he is. But is he your God? Okay. Is he your God? Or is he just a Christmas story? Is he a decoration that you put under the tree once a year? Is he a day off of work? Is he, you know, Christmas cookies or, or whatever you want to call it? Is he your God? Because if he is your God, then that demands certain actions from us. And those actions are that we serve him. In Isaiah chapter 46 and in verse 9, it says, uh, remember the former things from long past. And he's, and he's dealing with, with them about Babylonian idols and how, how they're just worthless and, and foolish. And he says, remember the former things uh, long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which had not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. Now, some people attribute this uh, prophecy to Cyrus, who came and brought them freedom from the Babylonian captivity, but also it's also a messianic prophecy as well. The point is, God has fulfilled all his prophecies about the Messiah. Now, if he has been faithful to fulfill all the prophecies concerning his birth, Understand, he will fulfill everything concerning his return. Okay? Which brings us to the next question is, are you ready for that? Amen? Um, we joke about things today, and, and I've heard a lot of folks say it. I've said it myself. You know, Christmas kind of snuck up on us this year, you know, and you, and you kind of like, I'm not even ready. I get it. I understand that. But don't let life overtake you so much that you're not ready for the return of the Lord. Amen. Don't allow yourself to be so distracted by things that you're not prepared for the return of the King. Because trust me, that's more important than Christmas. Amen. Let's, let's pray about that. Lord, we do. We, we thank you that we can trust your word. You, you've given us so many different things in your word uh, concerning uh, the birth of your son. All those things came to pass. You gave us a lot of words and prophetic words about the life of Christ. All those things came to pass. You prophesied about his death. It all came to pass. You prophesied about his resurrection. It all came to pass. The only thing that's left as far as coming to pass is his return. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us as a people to be ready, to be prepared for what you have. And in the meantime, Lord, while we're waiting for your return, help us to be, in, to be busy, employed in your kingdom work. Help us, Lord God, to be ready to give every man an answer for the hope that lies within us. And Father, when we stand before you, Lord, let us not be alone. And we thank you for that. I do pray, God, your greatest blessing on this congregation, Lord that you would give us favor as we interact with people, especially uh, in this time, because once again, this is a, a very 
easy time to talk about the Lord. So I pray your blessing on this congregation. Help us, Lord God, to speak the truth with love. Help us, Lord God, to speak the truth with your anointing. And help us, Father God, to have joy in serving you. Uh, the world looks and tries so hard to make this a, uh, just a difficult time for everyone a time of futility and a time of, of just greed. But Lord, we say, no, no, we're going we're gonna to serve our King. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.